Hello and welcome to the History Extra podcast from BBC History Magazine, Britain's best-selling history magazine. I'm Ellie Cawthorn. On today's podcast, we've got a discussion about the globe-spanning legacy of Maoism with award-winning historian and author Julia Lovell. Julia is Professor of Modern Chinese History at Birkbeck. This week, her latest book, Maoism, A Global History, was announced as the winner of 2019's Kundal History Prize, of which we are a media partner. Our editor, Rob Attar, spoke to Julia to find out more about why the Chinese leader's brand of communist ideology has been so pervasive. OK, so, uh, Julia, first of all, how do we actually define Maoism and how does it differ ideologically from other forms of communism? It's important to remember that Maoism doesn't mean only one thing. It stands for a range of ideas attributed to Mao over the past 80 years. And these ideas have been translated and mistranslated on their journeys around China and the world. And several of these ideas are, in fact, mutually contradictory. But I'm going to try and pull out some of the main threads here and also outline the ways in which they differ from earlier, especially Soviet forms of uh, Marxism-Leninism. So first, within the context of Chinese communism, Mao was notable for championing the use of political violence to achieve the revolution. And a couple of his most famous catchphrases, power comes out of the barrel of a gun and revolution is not a dinner party, express this idea. And this is quite an important part, I think, of Mao's global appeal. So since the 1930s, Mao has been celebrated by insurgents across the world as the architect of kind of defiant, protracted guerrilla warfare. Um, But of course, it's important to point out that, you know, his championing of political violence to achieve the revolution also has exacted a huge and tragic human cost, um, especially within China, where tens of millions of people died uh, as a result of uh, his political experiments. The next point to make about Maoism is that it has a strongly nationalist, non-Western, anti-colonial agenda. So Mao declared to radicals in developing countries that Russian-style communism should be adapted to local national conditions. Um, He declared that the Soviet Union could go wrong. So one way in which he diverged from Stalin and Lenin uh, was that he told revolutionaries to take their struggle out of the cities and deep into the countryside. Mao also preached the doctrine of voluntarism. So he proclaimed that um, if only they dared to believe they could, the Chinese and any other people could transform their country. So Mao believed that revolutionary zeal rather than weaponry or wealth was the decisive factor in revolution. And the last point I want to make highlights Mao's contradictions. Mao was a profoundly autocratic man. Like Lenin, like Stalin, Mao was determined to build a militarised one-party state that worshipped its supreme leader, i.e. him. But he also, especially in his last decade, championed a kind of anarchic insubordination. He told the Chinese people that it's right to rebel, Zhao Fan Yoli. And during the Cultural Revolution, he used his own cult to mobilise millions of Chinese people, especially indoctrinated, starstruck youth, to smash party rivals whom he deemed counter-revolutionary. So this last decade of Mao's rule and thought and practice, 1966 to 1976, really brings together this bizarre contradiction of you know Mao encouraging his own personality cult using his own autocracy to mobilize tens of millions of Chinese people to rebel against the party state that he had built. Uh, in 1949 70 years ago famously China became a, a communist country and that was a, to some extent a great vindication of Mao. Why do you think that his ideas found such fertile ground in China at that time? Mao came to power in the Chinese Communist Revolution in 1949, first and foremost at the end of a huge and 
bitter and violent civil war. So it was Mao's prestige uh, of having won this military success against his main rivals for power, the nationalists, uh, in 1949, which sort of underpinned his victory, sort of underpinned the, the victory of the Chinese Communist Revolution at that point. But of course, it wasn't just a military victory that in order to get support from local populations, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, especially after 1945, rolls out a land reform programme. So redistributing land from some of the richest landowners to some of the poorest. And it's by getting a lot of the poorest in Chinese society on side, at least in part that enables the communist military effort to succeed in 1949. So it sort of rests on support from local rural militias, um, uh, on getting sort of food and other equipment um, from the grassroots. So there's a combination in 1949 of military factors and also socio-economic factors underpinning Mao's victory. And you mentioned earlier that Mao's ideas began spreading around the world as far back as the 1930s. I'm interested to know how that happened, considering this was already some 15 years before he was actually to take power. In the global history of Maoism, a very important moment, uh, a very important vector in these ideas is an American journalist and author called Edgar Snow. And Edgar Snow was trailblazing because in 1936, a time when the Chinese Communist Party were still locked in a civil war with their main rivals, the nationalists, um, and the nationalists had set up a blockade around the Chinese communist state in northwest China. At that moment, Edgar Snow made this very dangerous journey from Beijing out to northwest China uh, to try and find out for himself what the Chinese communists were like. For various reasons, Edgar Snow was quite well disposed towards the Chinese communist project. He was highly critical of the faults of nationalist rule in China at the time. The Chinese communists in northwest China, not completely controlled by Mao at this point, you know, the the second half of the 1930s through to the early 1940s is the period through which Mao clambers his way up to a position of paramount leadership over the Chinese Communist Party. And he's sort of made a lot of progress towards this position by mid-1930s, 1936, but his position is not supreme at this point. But he's an important player in the Chinese Communist Party. And the Chinese Communist Party is also very keen to make use of Edgar Snow's visit to give him quite carefully uh, controlled and orchestrated access, hoping that when Edgar Snow left the Chinese communist area to write up his book, he would give them as favourable a write-up as possible. Um, And so as part of this programme, Mao gives Edgar Snow dozens of hours of interview access. So Edgar Snow comes away from northwest China after um, a stay of several weeks with about 20,000 transcribed words from interviews with Mao, which actually have been sort of carefully sort of read over and edited by Mao to make sure that they bring out the story that um, Mao and his comrades want to be brought out. Um, The following year, Edgar Snow writes up all this material into a hugely influential book called Red Star Over China. And it's this book with its very sympathetic portrayal of of Mao and of the Chinese Communist Party, which really establishes Mao as a global political personality. It's very influential, for example, amongst high-level American political circles and parts of the State Department. It becomes a bestseller in English and other languages. It's read, for example, amongst Russian partisans during World War II. So sort of they take lessons in how to fight guerrilla warfare 
Warfare from how Edgar Snow writes up the Chinese communist guerrilla warfare in the Northwest in the 1930s. Um, it's a big influence on the Malayan Communist Party, which is a Chinese dominated Communist Party, which fights uh, the so called emergency, a rebellion against British colonial rule from 1948 onwards. And this book, Red Star Over China, has you know, traveled incredibly widely in time as well as space. Uh, so it had an impact on West German radicals and American radicals in the counterculture movement of the 1960s. So it's very important in uh, selling a particular idea of the Chinese Communist Revolution. It was also uh, remarkably an important book, for example, for the Nepali Maoists as they planned their Maoist civil war uh, in the 1990s, which itself transformed the destiny of contemporary Nepal. What was it that made Mao and Maoism such an inspiration for revolutionaries across the world? The appeal of Mao's ideas is very varied, just as I was trying with your first question to express the way that Mao's ideas have changed over time and been translated and mistranslated in many different ways. Um, if we travel to, say, Western Europe and North America, where there was something of a vogue for the ideas of the Cultural Revolution and of Mao during the late 1960s through to the 1970s, so Western radicals misread Mao as a kind of playful anarchist and they misread the Cultural Revolution as a youthful revolt. If we travel to Africa, for example, African anti-colonial fighters particularly seized on Mao's um, anti-imperialist statements, his famous quotation, imperialism is a paper tiger, and were also attracted by Mao's techniques of mass mobilisation. So those ideas were um, uh, translated into Shona by ZANU guerrillas during their war against uh, white rule in southern Rhodesia through the 1970s. Uh, Southeast Asians, by contrast, um, so guerrillas in North Vietnam or in Malaya, were attracted by Mao's ideas about party building and guerrilla warfare. And if we cross over now, for example, to Latin America, to Peru, where a brutal Maoist civil war was fought uh, through the 1980s up to the early 1990s. Peruvian Maoists, such as the leader of the Shining Path, Abimael Guzman, took from Maoism and Mao a quasi-messianic, as almost, almost religious certainty that it was their destiny to lead a Maoist people's war which would inevitably uh, succeed. How far did Mao himself in power seek to foster and support revolutions abroad? The globalisation of Mao's ideas was no accident because Mao actively bid for leadership of the world revolution, especially after the 1950s. So the People's Republic of China, the PRC under Mao, widely exported not only ideology, including hundreds of millions of copies of Mao's Little Red Book, but also harder currencies of revolution, money, weapons and training for global insurgencies, especially in the developing world. So especially through the 1960s, Beijing and training camps in South and East China became hubs for a diverse bunch of international rebels. And some of them went on to lead insurgencies that changed the destinies of the countries in which they operated. Um, one example would be Josiah Tongagora, the military commander behind ZANU's victory over southern Rhodesia. Um, another, uh, Abimal Guzman, the leader of the Shining Path in Peru, uh, with his Maoist civil war uh, across the 1980s that, that claimed almost 70,000 lives. So both these individuals undertook military and political training in Beijing and uh, eastern China in the 1960s. Now, China's rulers don't like to dwell now on the country's desire to lead the world revolution under Mao because it doesn't fit with contemporary rhetoric about China's peaceful rise to superpower status and about China's non-interference in other countries. But it is all the same, an important part of Cold War history and one that has many contemporary afterlives. 
So do you think that we tend to downplay China's role in the Cold War era? I think, yes, uh, until recently, there has been a tendency, at least outside non-specialist circles and within general histories of the Cold War, to uh, neglect or marginalise the role played by China in this conflict. When I was first starting to think about writing this book, my first feeling was actually one of surprise that the book did not already exist. You know, why don't we already have a global history of Mao and Maoism? You know, this gap contrasted very starkly with the quantities of books that we have written in English uh, about the global impact of, say, Hitler or Stalin. I think there are a couple of reasons for why Mao and Maoism's global impact has been, to an extent, neglected. Um, One reason is to do with the global Cold War or the outcome of the Cold War, at least in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. So when the Soviet bloc states suddenly collapsed between 1989 and 1991, I think there was a widespread assumption that communism in general, communist regimes had been sent to the dustbin of history and that therefore there was perhaps no need to engage seriously uh, with these ideas, even when they underpinned regimes which were still holding on to power as the Chinese Communist Party was after 1989. But I think that China uh, has also contributed to the effacing of awareness of the global history of Maoism for the reason that I alluded to above, namely that this history of Mao wanting to lead the world revolution just doesn't fit with contemporary foreign policy narratives about peaceful rise, about non-interference in other countries. You know, these narratives are very important to the contemporary Chinese self-image because many people in China, many politicians in China do see the country as becoming a global superpower and there's a desire to contrast China's behaviour and China's rise to superpower status with uh, the rise centuries earlier of the West, which of course was extremely aggressive um, and colonialist and imperialist in the history of its own rise. Still to come on the History Extra podcast... Even in, say, British joke books, it seems permitted for children to make jokes about Mao. You alluded earlier to some of the terrible atrocities that took place under Mao's regime, such as the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Did these cause a setback at all to the popularity of Maoism around the world? While Mao was in power, knowledge about what was going on in China under Mao was very tightly controlled. So, for example, in Anglophone circles, knowledge about the full extent of the enormity of the famine that followed the Great Leap Forward in the early 1960s was not made accessible until the 1990s. Um, Similarly, with regard to the Cultural Revolution, the main conduits for information about these events were through official Chinese publications, which emphasise the sort of rather high-flown political theory of um, making society more egalitarian, breaking down the barriers between mental and manual labour and so on. And these official sources, you know, almost entirely left out far more horrible and unsavoury details, you know, about mass violence, even, even cannibalism took place in parts of China. 
So knowledge of the enormities committed under Mao's rule did not emerge into the public sphere until at least the 1980s, if not the 1990s. Why do you think it is that Maoism hasn't necessarily been tainted in quite the same way that Nazism and Stalinism have been? I think this perhaps tells us something about how Mao and his ideas are insufficiently understood, especially in the West. Perhaps the spread and the resilience of these ideas are or have been underestimated by non-specialist analysts, these ideas have um, arguably been seen as irrelevant, as consigned to the dustbin of history, and therefore perhaps as more unthreatening and more mockable than, say, the ideas of Nazism and Stalinism that seem so much physically closer to us. I think this phenomenon also tells us something about Western attitudes to China in general. So since the early modern period, China has been serially misunderstood or treated with insufficient realism or rationality by non-specialist Western observers. So it's been in turn idealised, romanticised or mocked. It's been seen as remote and exotic, a place you can project onto. And, you know, one of the cultural elements regarding the reception of Maoism that struck me as I wrote the book is that um, even in, say, British joke books, it seems permitted for children to make jokes about Mao. Um, you know, there's the the well-known stupid joke, who was the most powerful cat in China, uh, Chairman Miao. Um, uh, and it's impossible to think of an analogous joke being made about Stalin or Hitler, and yet all three have been shown by historians to be similarly destructive of human life. Um, So I think this silly joke tells us something important about cultural misperceptions of China. You have talked about this already a little bit, but how much of Maoism survives in contemporary China? Well, I'd argue that there's a particularly urgent need right now to re-centre Maoism in global history and politics because we're seeing a return, a selective return of Mao's rhetoric and practice within China itself at a time when China is far more globally powerful than it was under Mao. Um, So Mao and his ideas remain central to the legitimacy of China's communist government and that government's playing an increasingly important role in international politics. Taking a look at the history of this, on the face of it, Mao's successor, Deng Xiaoping, dismantled Mao's keynote policies, things like collective farming or the huge public political purges of the Cultural Revolution. But Mao was never removed from the political core of the People's Republic of China. And he's left a heavy mark on its politics and society. For example, in the politicisation of the judiciary, uh, the supremacy of the one-party state, the intolerance of dissident voices, and of course, the political capital that Mao retained. So his huge portrait still hangs on the northern edge of Tiananmen Square, which is the heartland of Chinese political power. And his embalmed body uh, lies in a mausoleum in the centre of the square. And Mao's legacy in contemporary Chinese politics became particularly conspicuous after 2012. So that year, the Chinese Communist Party under the current president, Xi Jinping, began for the first time since Mao's death in 1976 to publicly renormalise aspects of Maoist political culture. Things like uh, criticism, self-criticism sessions, which were a sort of key part of the Maoist political repertoire for uh, propaganda and thought control since the 1940s. Uh, Xi Jinping has brought back catchphrases such as the Mass Line, which is, you know, another uh, Maoist slogan from the 1940s, supposedly all about encouraging criticism of officials from the the grassroots. And most notably of all, Xi Jinping has brought back the personality cult 
And at the end of February 2018, Xi Jinping and his Central Committee abolished the 1982 constitutional restriction that limited the president to only two consecutive terms. So like Mao, Xi Jinping could be ruler for life. And just recently, on the 1st of October 2019, China marked the 70th anniversary of Mao Zedong's founding of the People's Republic with a spectacular display of military hardware in Tiananmen Square and by invoking Mao as the founder of the nation. To what extent does Maoism nowadays still appeal beyond China's borders? I think we can find an active appeal still, especially in South Asia, in India and Nepal, where since the 1960s, Mao's ideas and practices have inspired parties and insurgencies that are still with us today. So the Indian government has called the Maoist insurgency in central and eastern India the most serious internal security problem that it faces. And the Maoist insurgency in Nepal between 1996 and 2006 transformed the destiny of that particular state. So it was largely the Maoist insurgency that led to the dissolution of the monarchy after the end of the civil war in 2006. And two Maoist leaders have served between them three terms as prime minister uh, since 2006 again. So Maoist politics uh, have reshaped the political landscape of Nepal. That was Julia Lovell. Julia's book, Maoism, A Global History, is on sale now, published by Bodley Head. For more on the Kundal History Prize, head to our website, historyextra.com. Thanks for listening. Today's podcast was produced by Ben Hewitt and Jack Bateman. We'll be back on Thursday when I'll be talking to Nicola Tallis about the Tudor matriarch, Margaret Beaufort. <laughs>